You ready? Yeah. You ready? All right, hold on. Here we go. What's going on, everyone? This is the My Aggie Nation podcast. I'm Travis Brown with the Eagle. I'm alongside good old Alex Miller, also of the Eagle. Alex, how's it going? Travis, we're in our new studio. We are How in the new dig. It's great. I mean, so this is our new Eagle studio at the Eagle. Um, it, it, there's going to be some stuff added. This is very bare bones right now, but we wanted to break it in. This is going to be pretty fantastic. And uh, I mean, are you feeling cozy? I am. I am. We're, we're doing well. Uh, yeah, it's great. Yeah, for sure. It's, you know, last week's episode, we, we were hoping it would be that warm sports uh, campfire, you know, curled up in a cabin of, of nice, d- you know, docile tones of sport on a bearskin rug. I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore, but we hoped it was comfortable. It wasn't as good as we liked, but maybe this one will be even better. And if for whatever reason you still have complaints, send them to Robert.Cessna at the end. As always, as always. So... There's sports happening, isn't there, Alex? There is. In, in Texas A&M, they're headed up north. Uh, they're going to New York City. Cue some Jay-Z or Frank Sinatra. I mean, they're going to the semifinals up at Madison Square Garden there in New York City. Uh, you know, Travis, it, it, we talked we talked last time about how A&M might have gotten snubbed if they got snubbed. Well, they've been able to, you know, keep things rolling. In, in your opinion, through these first three games of the NIT, what's really made A&M allowed to keep keep it going uh, in the postseason here. Yeah, it, I mean, it's been a, a lot of effort. It's been a lot of defensive effort, especially in that game against Wake Forest. Wake Forest was one of the top 20 best um, scoring teams and one of the top 10 best, I believe, teams in field goal percentage. I mean, just an offensive juggernaut. And A&M, they were, uh, Wake Forest was down to like 17% shooting from the field at one point in the first half. And A&M pretty much was a wire-to-wire winner. I mean, they were a wired wired winner and they wasn't even really close. It got down to about nine points in the second, but it was all because of that defensive effort because offensively they only shot, uh, I want to say it was like 30 something low 30% uh, in, in that game. And they were um, 10 for 22 on layups. I mean, and then they were shot, uh, I believe high 50% from the free throw line. So it, it wasn't a great offensive game. It was a game that earlier in the season they probably would have lost because they just didn't shoot the ball, but that defensive effort was so good that they were able to minimize anything Wake Forest was able to do offensively. And, I mean, that's kind of been a staple. They, they've, If you look through the, the conference tournament when they went on that run, they were shooting like above 50% from three-point range, and that was a good reason why they were able to stay in some of those really competitive games. And, and shooting always wins games, duh. But they're able to now eke out some of those wins defensively that maybe they wouldn't have during that eight game losing stretch. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting because, you know, in the SEC tournament, they were just knocking down three pointer after three pointer. And, and in the NIT, they, they, ha- they really haven't shot as well from behind the arc. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like that first half against Wake Forest was just kind of the epitome of kind of the basketball that they're playing right now. Um, and, you know, just, just from my vantage point, kind of watching uh, from afar, you know, throughout the middle of the season, you know, Buzz was talking about how much they stressed those ATOs and how they really weren't executing after that. Just from my perspective, I mean, I don't have necessarily the numbers to back it up, but it really seems like they're executing well out of those out of those timeouts and, and you know, inbounds plays and those possessions right there. I think to, to expand on that a little bit, one of the things that they are have, have been doing is just they're executing Buzz's system a little bit better. Um, I, I think with the way that they want to run with the way Buzz Williams is able to run his um, teams at Virginia Tech when they are small, it, it has a lot to do with um, being in the right position, especially being in the right position for rebounding. And I think that because they had guys who didn't quite know where to be in the right spot, how to rebound well, they were having to go big a little bit during that stretch. They weren't so well with Ethan Henderson and... Um, uh, Henry Coleman out there, and that takes away a little bit from having some of those shooters out there. But when you have uh, a system now that, that changed a little bit and you have a guy like Tyrese Radford who can play one through four and he has a little bit more adjustment and that he knows where to be, you have Manny Obiseki who has been able to play one through four and, and, and he can kind of get adjusted into the system and play good defense, be at good spots to help his team rebound. That's been the absolute difference in everything is, is just... Um, 
having guys in the right positions. And I think that that is something that was seen has been seen through this last little stretch. Is I think a lot of the concepts that Buds is trying to teach them when it comes to rebounding, when it's coming to positioning, and when it's coming to um, starting possessions in the right way, that's where A&M has excelled lately. Well, you know, the NIT field, it's been pretty competitive so far, I feel like. There's been some good games out there. Uh, looking at looking at who A and M might face uh, down the road and who they're going to face next Tuesday, Washington State is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, what are you kind of seeing from this Final Four bracket? And on, on the other side, that that other semifinal game should be pretty good as well. Yeah, it's Xavier and St. Bonaventure. You know, uh, Washington State went into Provo against a pretty good BYU team uh, and, and kind of boat raced them through through most of it. So I, I think when you get this far in the bracket, you have teams that are hungry. You have teams that. Uh, a lot of times it's these teams that, like A&M, really put together a strong end-of-the-season run and uh, are a different team than maybe they were when the last couple of weeks of consideration with the, with the uh, tournament. Man, it just feels to me like, and I know this is going to sound slightly homerish, and I don't mean that, but it, this, this team, this A&M team, seems a little bit like a team of destiny. I mean, with how they were left out of the tournament, with how uh, Buzz didn't even really have them set up a practice for um, Alcorn, Alcorn State, State yeah. because of everything that went on before that. And then to come back in and have this team reset. I mean, you know, I, I was talking to someone the other day during the um, uh, Wake Forest game, and they were asking me a little bit about kind of how we do our job and write. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you know, we're the unbiased media. We don't root for a team. You, you Sometimes it's, it's hard not to root for some of the players, but you don't really root for the players. But you do root for your story. And so you're sitting out there looking and say, well, you know, A&M, the, uh, they, they, they've led this whole game, but it got cut down to nine. And you know, you know what would be great? What if Hassan Diara, the New York City native, comes in and, and tears it up? Well, he hits two threes to widen the gap, and it never gets below double digits after that. Uh, and, and so it's cool to be able to see how some of those instances where, like, the right story just happened to, to step in. The only thing that I'm worried about a little bit, and it... This is being a little stereotypical because I don't necessarily think this is indicative of a Buzz Williams team. But you have a team that has spent so much emotional energy over the last two weeks after, through the SEC tournament, not practicing for a week, going, you know, playing, what was it, uh, five games in six days, um, and then not making the tournament, and then turning around and have to be in the NIT, and Buzz's emotional statement, and all of this stuff that, that happened – Getting to New York, it's the first time this program has advanced past the third round in the NIT. Getting to New York is a big accomplishment. Is it going to be a thing where they get there and they exhale and they don't have that same edge? I think that's a cliche kind of lazy sports take that is something that could happen. I just don't see a Buzz Williams team after everything that's happened going up there and, and losing that emotional edge that is kind of a core of, of, of that program. Yeah, and you know, uh, you know, you, you think about kind of the key pieces. Uh, you think about Quentin Jackson. I mean, just the, you know, standing ovation he got as he walks off the court. I mean, even watching Buzz, you know, you can he, he's a pretty animated guy on the sideline, but you can really just see the passion that he's had over the last two weeks in particular. And, you know, it just seems like they're having fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, I feel like that's a big, just intangible that they're having. They're just having fun, and they're just really clicking. And, you know, even guys like Andre Gordon and, and even Hassan Diara, who may not get a, a bulk amount of minutes, they come in and they're given they're given good minutes when they're in. Hayden Hefner, he's become a little more than just a three-point threat. We've seen him on the defensive end and getting to the hole as well, you know. I think I think a team of destiny. It's it's, it's kind of, it is kind of an accurate statement, and I wouldn't be surprised if A&M was able to just close this thing out and, and make a run all the way to the end. Because you look at it too, you know, you you want to think about teams that have been really good and and, and made strong runs. It's it's because they 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 have just this really great offense, or and A&M does have a really really elite defense, but it, it, the pieces just seem to always fall in place. At the right time, when one, you know, Quentin Jackson shoots like three of six um, last week at at uh, or at the Wake Forest game from the field, he's zero for six from three point range. That's not a normal. Usually, if you see those stats, that means A and M's going to lose because Quentin Jackson has been pretty much their everything through all of this, and and they just found the right way to play defense. They had a few other guys step up and get some points. 
to where it just happened to work out. And, and shameless plug, I know we've talked a lot about Hassan Diara, the the, uh, the Queens, New York native. We actually are have for this next segment, have a conversation with him. I sat down, talk a little bit about uh, going back to New York, a little bit about this team, a little bit about him and coming to A&M uh, and a little bit about Buzz Williams. So that'll come next. But but. Also, and I don't know if you have any other basketball things to talk about. Well, I, I just wanted to I just wanted to ask you, you know, you'll be able to go up to New York and cover A and M's, you know, final push there in the NIT. You know, anything in New York that you're you, you know, you might You wanted to, to ask me about food, right? I, I did want to ask you about food. I, I'm curious, did Hassan give you any pizza recommendations? They are gonna go get stand? pizza. They are gonna go get pizza. He said he 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 said Buzz actually has a spot that he really? won he's taking the okay. team, but he didn't know which one that was. Uh-huh. So uh I, I have some ideas of what I'm going to do up there. You know, it, w- with these trips, a- as you have, have learned when you're going, you, you get all excited. You're like, I'm going to go to New York and the, the company's paying for it. I'm going to get to go. Expl-. Well, you don't really right. get to explore. So it's going to be like I come out of my hotel. What's kind of one of the few places around? Maybe look at the Yelp. So we'll see. Um, I know. I think the, the basketball team said they might be going to take in a, a Broadway musical. Oh, that's fun. It, I, you know, if we if they, uh, if they win. Yeah, yeah. Tuesday, I, I, maybe it's still impossible to get. I don't know. It would be really nice to see if I could uh, swing some Hamilton tickets. Oh, I would. I would sure would like cool. to see some Hamilton. You know, something I'm interested to see is how many A and M fans end up going. You know, you, you, you see, you saw how you know fans really took advantage of kind of the free admission at Reed Arena. Mm-hmm. You know, New York's a destination. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know if there's anybody that you know. I know here in College Station that spring break was last week. But, you know, maybe up in the Dallas or Houston areas, people are uh, on spring break themselves over there, just kind of, you know, different weeks varying. But at the same time, like, uh, New York is a destination trip. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can make you can make a whole weekend, a long week out of that. Which yeah. Would be cool. Yeah, it'll and be Madison interesting. Square Garden, I mean, that's a great place to watch a basketball game well, it, if you're going to watch one. I know people like to... to crap on the NIT as a consolation tournament, but it has a history, especially being oh, at yeah. Madison Square Garden. It has it has its own little aura uh, of what goes on up there. And, and if, yeah, the the first three rounds might be a little bit of, yeah, whatever. But if you're in that final four and you get to go to Madison Square Garden, and which, by the way, news broke this week that yeah. they, at least for the next two years, they're going to put out a bidding process and might move that around. And, man, that's a shame because I think that's something that does make it separate is it has that destination it has that ma- it, it feels this might be a little bit of me putting my own spin on it because i love this event so much but it, in a way it kind of feels like the college world series a little bit in old rosenblatt mm. where you have that little bit of history a little bit of tradition uh, a lot of cool things have had happened to madison square garden so having it there having that be the ultimate destination adds a little bit something to it yeah i mean if you're talking if you're talking iconic stadiums i mean in football it's like the rose bowl in in baseball it's like rosenblatt or maybe like a fenway yankee stadium wrigley basketball it's madison square garden mm-hmm. like that's the place and that's the allure of making uh you know a run in the nit worthwhile is that you actually get to go play there mm-hmm. if you if they move it to like uh, I know. Is it was it is it TD Garden in Boston? Or that has like a little a, bit. Maybe maybe Vegas. Sta- that's well, cool. yeah, but they do that with that. Maybe a Staples Center. You know, give them that NBA experience and and an NBA experience that's not sending them to like Milwaukee or something. You know, like a traditional NBA experience that would be <laughs> kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> no, no offense to my friends that live in Kansas. City. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Hey, you get good barbecue there. Hey. Baseball's going on as well. Baseball is going on. And, you know, a and got a really big uh, series win last week over LSU. You know, I'll be honest, Travis, I would not have expected a and to go to Baton Rouge in their current state and have won two of three. Honestly, probably should have won that third game, too. What do you think was maybe the most impressive thing about uh, a and M series win over LSU last weekend. Yeah, well, it's the fact that the bat stepped up and got some timely hits, and they were able to, to do... Um, get some of those runners in that have been stranded out there for a lot of time. I think that they were helped out a lot. And this was something that I was interested in because this kind of plagued LSU a little bit when they were going through uh, the Shriners classic down in Houston is, is that they're not a great fielding team and A&M was able to take advantage of some of those fielding errors, some, some of those uh, free bases and, and really put those to use because and as we saw with that Rice midweek game, too, on Tuesday, the bullpen, the pitching staff still isn't quite where they need it to be. But if you're putting up, whether, you know, nine, eight, nine, ten runs, if in the case of the Rice game, 15 runs, 
Like you can over that. That is a level that you can overcome some right. bad pitching with. It's just can they? If this pitching staff is what it is, can they continue to produce at that level? Because that's a tough ass too. You know, a, a couple of guys that have really stood out to me, just kind of watching the the baseball team from afar as well. Uh, Jack Moss has been just knocking the the leather off the ball, and and how about how about Logan Britt too? How, how big have they been at the plate in particular? Uh, yeah, I mean Jack Moss is a about the purest hitter that they have. Got a big grand slam uh, against uh, Rice in that that Tuesday game. He's about the most pure hitter that they have, and he's been able to 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 really. Um, stay consistent in what he's doing at the plate. Logan Britt has had a little bit of an up and down. He started great. He had that uh, home run uh, against, I think it was Houston Baptist, actually missed a sign, got pulled during the game because he missed a sign, and Schlossnagel was laughing after it because he's like, I'm the only coach in America who the guy he drops a bomb and you pull him because he missed a sign earlier in that. But it would have been a two-run two home run, but he got a guy thrown out on a failed hit-and-run. And so uh, he's been a little bit up and down. It's great to have him back in there. Troy Claunch is another guy who has been a real consistent guy at the plate. And there has to be something that's said about Cole Kaler at the top of the order. He, he isn't necessarily knocking the cover off the ball like some of these other guys have been, but he's drawing so many walks and getting on base. Is, uh, uh, on base percentages is certainly up there. And having those base runners on base, I compare it a lot. I like One of the worst hitting teams I think I've ever seen was that 2017 team, Braden Shoemakes last year. Um, where they, you know, went to the SEC tournament and uh, they just couldn't, they just couldn't hit the ball. Um, and uh, they not only could they not get runners in, they really couldn't get runners on base. And that's a bigger problem than necessarily getting runners on base and at times not being able to get them in because you at least have runners on base. You're forcing stuff to happen. I mean, even the Rice game, they had they balked in a run. I mean, you, you just don't know what's going to happen as long as you can get runners on base, and that's a good sign for them that they're able to do that. Yeah, and, you know, you look at that third LSU game, I think they left the bases loaded, what, three or four times? I mean, you know, that's kind of an anomaly, but, you know, the fact that they were in those positions, I mean, odds are you're going to knock in some of those runs on a normal day. The Major League Average, and I'm, I, I, of course, we're, doing, we're, we're testing this new system out, so usually we have our computers in front of us. I will remember to bring my <laughs> iPad in here next time so I can have the exact numbers for you, but I was talking to uh, Coach Schlossnagel before they went out to LSU. And the major league average for g driving runners in with a runner on third base is about 57%, I want to say. And, and so that's surprising because you think he's right there. Just, just do something. Just get him in. But about just a little over half the time is what happened is, is how you get those guys in. At that time, A&M was at like the upper 40s, I want to say, uh, uh, in that category, which isn't good um, um, there. But... It's not like, I, I think there is also kind of that idea that if there's a runner on third, he has to get in. I think that's the way you approach it as a team, but statistically, it's not always going to happen. They just need to find a way to get bump themselves up, you know, six or seven percentage points, and they'll be about where they need to be. Well, this is going to be a pretty big week this next week. You got your first home series in the SEC. They got a little bit of confidence. They're playing Auburn, uh, and then next Tuesday, they go on the road against Texas, which... I mean, Texas is obviously the more talented team, but as we've seen in years past, you know, records kind of maybe thrown out the window. We've seen some pretty close games when there's a little bit of disparity in these two teams. What are you, what are you really looking for for the Aggies this next week? I mean, the, it's the same thing that we've looked through, looked for through the last couple of weeks. It's, it's got to be the bullpen. The bullpen has got to solidify itself, and the bullpen has got to throw strikes, stop walking batters, stop giving free passes, and then stop letting those guys uh, get driven in because the bullpen has just been... The, 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 the thorn in their side. They, they got to find some guys who will throw strikes because even, uh, I believe, Will Johnson, uh, I'm going to get my games confused. I think it was the Rice. He, he got rocked pretty good. Will Johnson has probably been as steady as anybody since the Frisco Classic, uh, the lefty out of the bullpen. They, they've just got to find consistency in the bullpen because if you go up against the, this Auburn team is going to be pretty good. And then you go up against that Texas team and you, you bring in some guys who just aren't throwing strikes. A team like Texas is just going to jump all over that and it can get ugly fast so they've got to find some consistency in the bullpen ivan melendez he's a he's about as good a hitter as you're gonna see yes the uh the, the uh, Titanic Titanic. Titanic. i love I that love is a that. fantastic nickname that's gonna be a great atmosphere next week too i mean i know you're gonna be in new york but that, that's a tough one i mean i always try to go out there to, to those games and i have the last uh two or three times they've been out there and it's just so much fun 
Um, I, I, I'm so, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't trade it to, for, for New York this go around. Um, but yeah, if you haven't gone out there to see the good old Texas and, and Texas A&M, uh, baseball rivalry, man, it is fun to watch. Yeah. It'll be great when it's, when they're in the same conference again and, you know, they're playing a conference series probably every season as well. Hey, I want to, I'm going to throw you a curveball here a little bit. Okay. Cause I know this isn't necessarily your beat, but I believe you were out there, uh, Walk through a little bit, uh, Joni Taylor's introductory press conference. Yeah. I was off that day. I wasn't there. Uh, what did you take from that? What was your biggest takeaways, Alex? Yeah, you know, uh, the, the nor- typical reception, um, you know, it, it seemed as if A&M's had a long time, obviously, to, to go through this hiring process with Gary Blair announcing his retirement before the la- start of last season. So, you know, it, Ross Bjork and Kristen Brown, they, they've been working for several months now trying to find find the next coach. And, you know, it, it really seemed like everything pointed toward Joni Taylor when it was all said and done. You know, she, she's she's becoming an established coach. She's pretty young still. Uh, she's had some success at Georgia. You know, she she really she really got the crowd going. You know, she's got a pre-existing relationship with Gary Blair. It, it was nice to see him there. You know, they they recognized him for what he's done for the mm-hmm. program. Uh, Joni Taylor acknowledged him. Uh, you know, it, it, interesting too. Just you know, seeing all the current players there sitting on the very front row, looking at their new coach. Um, but yeah, it, you know, uh, you know, she certainly is familiar with the league. Uh, you know, it, it's gonna. You know, she kind of made her pitch to the to the Texas recruits of you know, kind of going with kind of what Jimbo Fisher does. You know, the, the inside out recruiting where they want to make Texas, you know, maybe the Houston and Dallas areas kind of their home base. But you know, she said they're gonna recruit nationally, and you know. Atlanta, as we've come to find out, you know, that that's really a hotbed for good women's basketball recruits. Uh, and, 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 you know, the, Georgia's, they had the number seven recruiting class last year, you know, so we'll, we'll see how that kind of plays out. But, you know, definitely uh, a lot of a lot of optimism, it seems, uh, in, in terms of, you know, h- handing the baton off to, to the next person of what Gary Blair has been able to build. Yeah, definitely. So uh, we'll definitely have more on her uh, leading forward as they she gets herself established here. Uh, we'll do some shameless plugs. Like you said, I'll be up in New York, so we'll have all kinds of coverage from the team being up there at the NIT, you know, staying around Times Square, around Madison Square Garden, and what they have going on. I was also able to go check out practice a little bit today, and I'm going to have a story coming out here in the next couple of days about uh, kind of shooting with Buzz and what that means, a new little practice thing he did, plus something about Hassan Diara going back up to his home. Uh, that'll be great as well. And in fact, in this next segment, we're going to hear from Hassan Diara, Haas, the guy that they give the clipboard to in the, in the, the huddle, the head coach, as Jim, uh, John Jimbo Fisher, Buzz Williams calls him. So that's next, and uh, we'll go ahead and bid you goodbye to the My Ignition podcast after, right now because it'll just end after me and Hassan are done. So we'll see you next week then. Stick around now for a little bit of me and Hassan DR. So yeah, Hassan, what, uh, what, I mean, I know it's a simple question we asked you, but what does it mean to be able to be uh, going back home to New York to play in the semifinals? Uh, to be honest, it means everything to me. You know, I get to play in front of my family for the first time in my career here. So I'm so excited, you know, I'm, and I'm excited for the guys as well, you know. A lot of them have never been to New York, so it's going to be a great experience for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what's, what's the first thing you're going to do when you get back there? <laughs> Hopefully I get to see my mom. But uh, we're going to go get, get some pizza, of course. You know, New York pizza is, is very big and very good. So a lot of guys haven't had it yet. So I want to take them there. How much was, uh, I mean, when you, I know y'all the disappointment of the NCAA tournament, but when you saw that the NIT and you know what the, the end result was that, how, how encouraging was that for you, um, knowing that you could be going home? Uh, it's definitely a motivation for me. Uh, you know, I, I want to play in Madison Square Garden for the first time, you know, play in front of my family, you know, play in New York where I'm from, you know. Because it's so far from Texas, so I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm yeah. excited. Yeah, what's, um, h- how have you been able to describe New York to some of your teammates who have, haven't been there before? Uh, what, what, what does that look like? Uh, it's a very fast-paced city. You know, a lot of people, um, a lot of everybody mind their own business, basically. But it, it's a fun city, you know, uh, great people, uh, and, and the culture is just so rich. Yeah. who who Who's going to be the most shell-shocked on the team when they when they get off the – the plane and, and see there? Um, 
I would say uh, Wade. Wade's gonna be the most shell shocked. He has never been, so he he's gonna be shell shocked. He's gonna be like, wow, this is this is amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, what 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 can you say has happened in the last ten games or whatever um, that that really kind of has gotten y'all on on the run that you're on? What 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 changed in your opinion? Uh, I wouldn't say anything changed. I would just say uh, we're executing at a high level. You know, we got we have like it's like a lightning bulb in a bottle. You know, we we have. Uh, enormous amount of energy and we're just feeding off each other because we love each other and we love playing with one another. I know that there's been a lot of uh, pictures on social media and stuff that's gone on at you with the clipboard and Buzz has called you the the head coach. Where, where did that kind of come about um, and, and what are those moments like for you? Um, it came about, you know, about, I say in the beginning of the year, you know, I was just being vocal and th- what we was facing some adversity and I was I was very vocal, you know, telling the guys what to do, telling them keep your heads up, keep going, we're gonna be perfectly fine. And I cherish those moments, you know. Uh he wants me to be a coach. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do it, but I mean I, I love helping the guys out. They love when I talk and I coach with the clipboard. So I just love doing it. Generally speaking, I know each instance is different, but kind of what are, what are you doing with the clipboard? What are, what are your what are you doing in those those huddles uh when when, when he does hand that over to you? Uh, I'm going over what we previously, previously, previously just did uh, going before the timeout and then going out of the timeout, you know, what, what we have to do next, you know, what's next, uh, whether it's a play or we're on defense or if it's a free throw block out. Have you always seen yourself as this kind of guy who is a, a little bit of a coach on the floor who could be handed the clipboard or is this something that Buzz has kind of pushed you to, to, to be a little bit? I wouldn't say he pushed me, but, you know, I, I just think it, it just happened naturally. So it just came to me, and I just, I just, I like doing it. Yeah. Um, so how does uh, uh, a guy from from New York make his way down to, to, to College Station? What? How did you find out about Texas A and M? Kind of what was that recruiting process like? Uh, you know, Coach Buzz Williams, he recruited me from the get go, uh, and the relationship we built was just so strong. And I just felt like you know he's the only coach I wanted to play for, so. I came to Texas. Uh, I took my visit here, and I really enjoyed it. You know, I thought the people were nice, and I'd seen myself here playing for as long as possible. A mm-hmm. little, little, little bit different than New York? A lot different <laughs> from New York. You know, everything is spread out. You know, you're near, you can walk everywhere, but um, out here you need a car. So I recently bought a car, so I'm doing well now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, what, um, what can you say? I know there's been a lot of talk about kind of the unity of this team and and um, the togetherness. How much y'all like each other? Where, where, where did where did that come from? Uh, it started when the guys got here. You know, in the summer. You know, we just used to hang out every day and just talk and just hang out and then play basketball against each other. You know, we love to compete against one another, and because of our competitive spirit against one another, we know we could trust each other during the game, and we're gonna fight against the other team. You know, I've been up there watching. How much of that with this shooting with Buzz thing that he put in this year um, kind of helped foster that? Because I know uh, uh, TJ was showing me some of the, the stats, some of the ways that y'all can compete with uh, shooting percentages. How, how much of that kind of helped foster some of that competitive, some of that um, bonding? Uh, you know, uh, it's definitely our competitive spirit makes us want to do well. So, you know, it's, it's like a competition, of course, you know, on who can shoot the best percentage, who can do it the fastest. And of course, you know, give credit to coach for him passing those balls for about five to six hours out of his day. So we appreciate that. And that just goes to show he'll he'll fight for us, he'll do anything for us. So we might as well just fight for him and do anything for him. Yeah, what what is that like? I mean, I'm I'm sure there's probably never been a time in your career where your your head coach is just gonna stand there and hand you balls through a whole routine. What 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 is that bonding like? What is those moments like that you get to spend with coach? Uh, it, it's definitely, it's definitely mesmerizing. You know, I will remember for the rest of my life. You know, it, it just shows the character of Coach Buzz. You know, he he wants the best for us, and he he knows what's right, and what's wrong, and him just shagging his ball and shooting it. Whether you're shooting bad, you're shooting amazing, he's still gonna be there. So it it just goes to show his, his relationship with each and every one of us. Not your traditional music. You got some kind of like 
some some seventies funk, some some easygoing music. What what is the what's with the music choice, and how does that help or or, or whatnot with the whole shooting with Buzz experience? I mean that that's Coach's Buzz, Coach Buzz's uh, music, so we had to go along with. It. He don't really like our music, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean I love it. You know, it, it's it's a change of pace, of course. You know, uh, slow jams. You know, a little bit of funky. You know, a little eighties and nineties flow. So I love it. Stuff that maybe did you hear that growing up around around the house a little bit oh, with your family? Oh yeah, definitely, absolutely. I know a lot of them, so, so yeah, I, yeah, I enjoy it. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, what what's been your favorite part about shooting with Buzz? What 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 do we look back and think like this is this is pretty cool and this was worth it? Uh, I would say my, my favorite part is uh, the reactions when you hit a ten out of ten, you know, because uh, that's a double win. So the reaction of the rebounders, Coach Buzz, and yourself, you're like, you're just so excited. It's, 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 I like it. I love it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what's what's the vibe in the locker room? What's the, the vibe with the guys heading into to New York this weekend? Uh, I know, like Q said, it's it's more business to be done. What um, what do y'all feel like is is the, the, the goal and, and, and what y'all have ahead of y'all? Uh, we understand what's at stake. You know, we definitely want to get a ring. Uh, we want to bring, bring the championship back home. So the vibe is good. We're excited to play. We're excited to play with one another uh, again and continue playing, you know, to the end of March, you know, because that was one of our goals. So we're excited. We're ready to go and we're ready to win. How much does the team feel like winning an NIT title um, or even some to some extent making it to New York is a little bit of um, vindication for maybe not making the field um, of the NCAA tournament of, of, of kind of proving proven everybody wrong? I think we, you know, we didn't make the tournament. I think we just used that as motivation, you know, to keep going and to to win the whole thing and to show them that, you know, you guys made a mistake, uh, which is okay. It's not bad, but, you know, we feel like we should have been. And yeah. I think winning the NIT would show like, oh, maybe they should have been. Did you ever grow up going to NIT, to Knicks games? Uh, what, what was your Madison Square Garden memories? Uh, I definitely went to Knicks games. Uh, I went to the Knicks game against Cleveland. Uh, they was playing Kyrie Irving and LeBron wasn't on the team yet, but I watched Kyrie Irving just demolish the Knicks. He had like 30 and it was just so amazing. I, I fell in love with the vibe in there. I fell in love with Kyrie. I l- always loved Melo, so I, it, it's just amazing. Man. It's a little little bit, you get those kind of nostalgic goosebumps when you first walk back in there and knowing that like, hey, you're, you're on the court now? Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I'm, I'm definitely going to be nervous. For sure, I'm already knowing. Uh, but you know, walking onto that court again, that vibe, just feeling the lights on me. I'm, I'm a. It's gonna be a, a different feeling, different feeling that I never had before. It seems like every day, everything just has a way, the way it must have seems. But if we don't watch what we're doing, our hearts will get ruined by silly things. Good loving needs a girl who know that's true. If we wanna keep it, we gotta watch everything that we do. Yeah, yeah. Don't wanna make sure my baby, make sure you're sticking with me. Don't wanna make sure.